In our last video, we explored what happens when mealworms, an animal, eat food. And we observed that when the mealworms ate potatoes, the mealworms gained mass, while the potatoes lost mass. We also saw that the BTB turned from green to yellow, meaning that carbon dioxide entered it. The carbon dioxide must have come from the mealworms, who, by the way, got their energy from the potatoes. And that's all well and fine at the macroscopic level, but now we want to zoom in to the nanoscopic level to understand what the atoms and molecules are doing. But before we go any further, let's establish our goal for this video. By the time that you finish watching this video, you should be able to use a chemical reaction to model what is happening in animals at very small scales. That means we're talking about nanoscopic and microscopic scales. This means we'll have to use our molecular modeling kit and revisit our rules of molecular bonding. So the atoms that we'll be dealing with most of the time are hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Hydrogen forms one bond, oxygen forms two bonds, and carbon will form four bonds. In this kit, hydrogen is white, oxygen is red, and carbon is black. Now, when we conducted our investigation, we saw that the mealworms took mass from the potatoes. But what chemicals are potatoes made of? Well, this might sound a little odd, but potatoes are actually made mostly out of sugars. The reason why potatoes don't taste very sweet is because these sugars form long chains called starches, and starches are not sweet. Now a sugar molecule looks like this, and we can draw out its structure using carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens to show where each atom goes. Notice the distinctive hexagon shape, with carbons making up most of the ring. What else do we already know about animals that might help us understand what's going on at the nanoscopic scale? You probably already know that animals have to breathe air to live, and that means oxygen. So maybe we can consider oxygen one of our inputs. So when you think about it, we already have both of our inputs, or reactants, sugar and oxygen. Now we can write these out in words. We can also build the structures using our molecular modeling kit. We can write out the chemical formulas showing how many of each atom each molecule has, and we can also draw out the structures of each molecule. So at this point, we've established all of our reactants, all the inputs to this reaction. Now as far as the outputs, we've already seen that carbon dioxide was produced. And if you've ever paid attention to your breath on a cold day, you would know that water is also produced in animals. So let's complete all the ways that we can show our outputs, or products. So here's the structures that we can build from our molecular kit, here are the molecular formulas, and here are the molecular structures as drawn. So here we can see we've completed the products side of this reaction, and we call this reaction cellular respiration. And the point here is that animal cells take in sugar and oxygen and release carbon dioxide and water. But all is not well here. So look carefully at the reaction that you see on the screen. Do you see something that might be wrong with how the reactants compare with the products? Take a moment to pause the video and see if you can figure out what's wrong here. How about we count the number of atoms on each side to find out whether they match? So on the reactants side, we count 6 carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 8 oxygens. However, in the products, we only count 1 carbon, 2 hydrogens, and 3 oxygens. And this is bad, very, very bad, because in chemical reactions, we have to follow one very important rule, and that is... Matter can be created or destroyed! Now, if you watched our video on balancing the burning ethanol reaction, you might be able to figure out how to fix this. Because matter can't be created or destroyed, we need to see the same number of atoms for each element on the reactant side and on the products side, and that is currently not the case. What would you have to do to the numbers of molecules in the reactants and in the products to fix this chemical reaction? Go ahead and pause the video, grab a pencil and a piece of paper, and see if you can figure this out. Now that you've given it a try, let's see if we can balance this chemical reaction. Let's start by balancing carbon. 
In the reactant side, we count six carbons in our sugar. And in the product side, we only count one carbon in our carbon dioxide. So in the case of carbon, probably the best thing to do is to add carbon dioxide molecules to the product's side until the number of carbons on both sides is equal. So now let's look at hydrogen. You might notice that the number of hydrogens on the reactant side and the product side are way off. There are 12 hydrogen atoms in the reactants, but there are only two hydrogen atoms over here in the products. So to balance hydrogen, it looks like we're going to have to add water molecules to the products side until the number of atoms of hydrogen on the reactant side and the products side are equal. So last of all, let's balance oxygen. Over in the reactants side, we count eight oxygen atoms. But over on the product side, we count 18 oxygen atoms. That means that the reactants are 10 oxygen atoms short. So to balance our oxygens, all we really have to do is now add more oxygens to the reactants side until the number of oxygens on each side is equal. Let's double check our work to make sure that we balanced this reaction properly. On the reactant side, we currently have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 18 oxygens. While over here in the product side, we currently have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 18 oxygens. This means that we have successfully balanced our reaction. We know this because the number of atoms of each element in the reactants is now equal to the number of atoms of each element in the products. And there's actually another way that we can prove that we balanced this reaction correctly. If we take all the molecules of our reactants, we should be able to rearrange them to create the products. So when we rearrange all the atoms, we can see that we create all of our products, which means that we must have balanced out our reaction properly. And there's one more way to write out our balanced reaction. We can use what are called coefficients to show how many of each molecule there is in this reaction. In this case, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water all have the coefficient of six. Six, six, six. Pick up sticks. So here's the complete balanced reaction for cellular respiration. This is how we usually see it written out. So let's try looking at this in a slightly different perspective. What this reaction is telling us is that for each sugar molecule that the mealworm eats, it requires six oxygen atoms to breathe in. And the chemicals produced as byproducts are six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. We'll look at what this means at the microscopic scale in a moment. Now let's not forget about energy. If you watched our video about burning ethanol, we discussed high energy bonds. And in general, that means bonds between carbon and hydrogen and carbon and carbon. And we find these high energy bonds in our sugar molecule. And the energy in these high energy bonds exists as what we call chemical energy, which is a kind of potential energy. Now chemical energy can be converted into a variety of forms, including heat, as is the case with this bombardier beetle, light, in the example of fireflies, certain underwater creatures, and even glowing fungi, and motion, which we already saw in our mealworms. And some creatures can even generate substantial electrical shock, as in the case of electric eels. So all that our mealworms are really doing is converting energy from their food into other kinds of energy. At this point, we've almost met our goal to be able to use a chemical reaction to model what's happening in the mealworms at very small scales. The last thing we really have to do is to consider this process at the cellular level. That means the microscopic scale. So if we picture one of the cells inside of our mealworm, we have sugar and oxygen coming into the cells. The worm consumes these. And don't forget that we have chemical energy riding in inside the bonds of the sugar molecule. And coming out of this cell as waste, we have carbon dioxide and water molecules, producing useful movement energy in the process. And this whole reaction that we see taking place in the cells of organisms, we call cellular respiration. Let's review our goal to make sure that you met it. After watching this video, you should be able to use a chemical reaction to model what is happening in animals at very small scales. If you can't do that, go back and watch the parts of the video that you don't understand. But remember, 
Science is not just about answers, it is also about questions. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video and come up with some questions that you still might have about cellular respiration or our mealworms. So here's a few interesting questions that we came up with. What causes the mealworms to increase in mass? What other chemical reactions are happening in the mealworms? And are there any chemicals besides sugar and oxygen involved? So until next time, remember, you can learn anything.